About a year and a half ago now, I started getting really interested in Aerogel, and despite it being kind of expensive, I went out and bought some. So I got this little square of it, which is pretty cool. It has this weird haziness to it, and it kind of looks blue. And this thing is also super light, where you can barely feel that it's in your hand. I mean, you definitely know it's there, but it's also, it's weird how light it is for something this big. But in any case, after getting this and playing around with it for a bit, I decided that I really wanted to make it. So I went online, and in the past I'd read a bit about what went into making Aerogel, but this time I really dove in a bit more, and I found that pretty much all of them use supercritical fluids, most commonly supercritical CO2. When I read about this, I went, oh, supercritical fluids, of course, supercritical CO2. I've heard about that before, I've read about it, I think I might have heard about it in school, but when I really started thinking about it, I'd never actually really seen it before, and I didn't really know what it was. I knew the basic idea of it, where a liquid is heated in some sort of closed vessel, and this causes the pressure to build up as it vaporizes. Eventually though, when the pressure and temperature get high enough, it reaches something called the critical point, and when we get past that temperature, it ends up going super critical, where there's no real difference between the liquid and the gas phase, and it kind of acts as a hybrid between the two. This to me, I guess on paper made sense, and when I would read about it online, but I couldn't visualize at all how that made any sense. I looked it up online, and I did find some videos that showed CO2 going super critical, but even after watching them all, I still didn't really feel like I knew what was going on. One of these videos though was made by Ben over at Applied Science, and he had built this pressure chamber specifically to see the whole phase change that was going on. So I contacted him, and I asked him if I could pay him to make one of these chambers for me, so that I could mess around with it and actually see in person what was going on, but instead, he just offered to send me the one that he already made, totally free of charge, and he wouldn't even let me pay for the shipping. At this point, that was kind of over a year ago now, and I've been a bit slacking on this whole project, but nonetheless, a uh, huge thanks goes out to Ben for helping me do this. So basically, I'm just going to be doing a bunch of random things with this nice pressure chamber that Ben sent me, and uh, seeing if I can find anything interesting when CO2 goes super critical. Ben did warn me though that this is kind of dangerous, which I, I knew by just looking at it. He tested it many times, and he trusted it in his video to hold it in his hand when the CO2 was super critical, but still, he warned me that, in theory, it was kind of like a bomb and it could explode at any time, but it should be safe, but he's not responsible. Okay, so the first thing that I had to do was open up the chamber and then add some dry ice, which is solid CO2. I packed in as much as I could fit, and then I put on the other half of the chamber, added the washers and the bolts, and cranked it all down. This part was pretty much the most important step, because if I didn't tighten it enough, the CO2 would end up just leaking out. It was also important though to not tighten it down too much, because this could add some extra stress to those large acrylic windows. I eventually felt that I'd done a pretty decent job, but by this point, almost all the dry ice had disappeared. There was really just a sad small amount left, and I decided instead of trying anything with this, I would restart everything, and I would just tighten everything down as fast as I could. This time, it was definitely way better, and to test it out, I just closed the valve to let the pressure build up. As the pressure increased, the dry ice slowly melted into liquid CO2, but I started noticing a problem. The liquid CO2 was boiling way too much, and this meant that there was a leak. Then, I started hearing a hissing noise, and I saw some white gas shooting out the back of the chamber. This happened because I was afraid of tightening it too much, but clearly, I was a bit too soft on it. But despite it being a failure, what it did show me was that if there was a leak, it wasn't just going to blow up or something. Even when it's super critical and the pressure's a lot higher, it would probably just leak out slowly like this and not fail catastrophically. Still though, just for safety reasons, and in case I'm wrong about this, I made sure to do everything behind some protective shielding. 
Now, I had a much better idea on how much I had to tighten everything down, so I did a third run, and it all worked. Like before, I closed the valve, which caused the pressure to start increasing, and for the dry ice to melt. Under the normal atmospheric pressure that we live in, carbon dioxide can only be a solid or a gas, but at higher pressures, it can also be a liquid. If we take a look at the phase diagram for CO2, we can see that it's only at 5 times atmospheric pressure that the liquid phase starts to appear. So, immediately after I closed the valve, it was all still jumping directly from being a solid to a gas. Eventually though, when the pressure built up to be about 5 atmospheres, it was all able to start melting. Up until this point, there was no leak, and it all seemed to be going pretty decently, but one major problem that I noticed was that the gauge wasn't moving at all. This was a pressure gauge, and I just said before that the pressure was increasing, but it was still around zero. This wasn't anything dangerous, but it clearly wasn't working properly, and there was a chance that it was just broken. To really test it, I just let it sit here for a bit to make sure that there were no leaks. I came back about 5 or 10 minutes later, and it seemed pretty good, so I opened the valve to vent out all the CO2. With the pressure now dropping below that 5 atmosphere threshold, all the liquid CO2 was jumping back into being a gas. Also, I'm not really sure about this, but I think that the cloudiness is just a mixture of liquid CO2 vapor and CO2 gas. After this run, I thought that maybe the gauge wasn't broken and was just plugged with something, so I took it off and tried cleaning it, and I did another run to test it out. But again, it didn't work, so it was probably just broken. As I said before, this wasn't really a safety issue or anything, but when trying to make this go super critical, it is nice to see what pressure it's at. As long as I'm really not careless, I shouldn't really have to pay attention too much to the pressure, but it is still something nice to have. I wish I had another spare gauge like this just sitting around, but I didn't, so in this case, I wasn't going to have that luxury. However, this didn't mean that I would have to do things completely blind, because besides looking at the pressure, I could also pay attention to the temperature. This chamber was already set up with a small hole drilled in the side that I could put a thermal couple in. This would let me carefully monitor the temperature, and now, to make it go super critical, I just had to heat it up. This was done using a hair dryer, and the goal was to bring it up to about 30 C. As it warmed up, the liquid CO2 started to boil, and the amount of it decreased, but unlike before, there wasn't a leak here. This meant that it was making more and more gas in the same confined space, which caused the pressure to increase, and it also caused the density of the gas to increase. And at the same time, the heat was causing the liquid CO2 to expand, and to slightly decrease its density. So as I kept heating it, the density of the two phases were getting closer and closer, and I noticed that it was getting harder to see the difference. Then eventually, it got to this point where there wasn't a clear separation between the two, and it was just this weird haze. This was what I assumed was the critical point, and here, the densities of the two phases were pretty much the same, so they started mixing together. At this point, I was well into the supercritical fluid area, and liquid CO2 was no longer able to exist. I then kept heating it, and the liquid part suddenly looked like it just turned into smoke. This is because, above the critical temperature of CO2, which is about 31C, there's just too much energy in its molecules for it to stay together as a liquid. So, all the CO2 molecules end up getting pulled apart, and they turn into something that's kind of like a gas. This means they're able to move around freely like a gas, and they're able to diffuse and fill this entire chamber. However, at such a high pressure, its density is abnormally high, and more like that of a liquid. This then lets it dissolve things like a liquid, and because of that, supercritical fluids are often described as a gas-liquid hybrid. So now in this chamber was just a bunch of supercritical CO2, but what's kind of cool is that I can turn it back into liquid CO2 by cooling it down. I got this idea from Ben, and by putting some ice on the side of it, I can drop the temperature below the critical temperature of 31C, and liquid CO2 can start forming again. Before, when I made it go super critical, and it all just kind of disappeared in a puff of smoke, I thought it was really cool, but I think I like this part more. This was because, in general, the idea of boiling something until it completely disappeared was something that I'd seen before, and it made sense to me.
However, here, I was starting with what looked like a completely empty chamber, and then making a bunch of liquid from nowhere. When it was eventually done, it was nearly half full, and I decided to make it go super critical again. But this time, I wanted to look at it at a different angle, and to see what the surface of it looked like. Just like before, as it got closer to the critical point, it got harder and harder to see the surface of the liquid CO2. Then, when it got close to what I assume is the critical point, it started to get a bit hazy. It also had a bit of a blue color to it, and it reminded me of aerogel, but I'm not exactly sure what was going on. Then, just like the other run, it all very quickly disappeared, and looked like it turned into a cloud of smoke. What I had now was this whole chamber, completely filled with supercritical CO2, but what was really weird, was that I just couldn't see it at all. If I were just randomly handed this, I would assume that it was completely empty, and the only thing that could maybe tell me otherwise was that the broken gauge was now reporting a little bit of pressure. When I was done playing around with it, I wanted to try emptying it while it was still all super critical. This caused the chamber to slowly become hazy, and I think this was because the pressure was dropping below the critical pressure. As this happened, I think the liquid and the gas phase were no longer able to stay all mixed together, and the liquid started separating out. It would have done this as extremely fine droplets though, and then very quickly jumped to being a gas, so there wasn't any condensation of liquid. Also, as the pressure dropped below that 5 atmosphere point, it just wouldn't have been able to be a liquid in general. So, after trying all that and seeing that it didn't just explode, I wanted to try some other things. I just saw that when it was super critical, it looked like it was completely empty, but it was still actually filled with a supercritical fluid. So what I wanted to see was what would happen if I put something solid in the chamber and how it would interact with the fluid. I happened to have some silica beads lying around, those things that you get in those little drying bags, and I thought that they would probably work pretty well. So I loaded up the chamber with a bunch of them, along with some dry ice, and I closed the valve. Like before, this caused it all to slowly melt, and eventually, I had a bunch of liquid CO2 with the silica beads at the bottom. I then shook it around a bit, and it pretty much looked exactly like what you would expect if you had a bunch of beads sitting at the bottom of a liquid. The liquid was able to slosh around pretty easily, but the beads mostly just like staying in the same place. I then shot it with my hair dryer to make it go super critical, and it was pretty much exactly the same as last time, except I now had some beads at the bottom. The interesting part was when I went to move it, and it still looked like it was under a fluid. It was like we just saw with the liquid CO2, and they were all bunching up, and didn't really like to move. As another test, I just strongly shook the thing up and down, to see how the beads would move. In an empty chamber, they would fly from the bottom and easily hit the top, but here, they were more or less staying in one place. Again, it was like the whole thing had been completely filled with a fluid, and it was preventing the beads from moving up. The test that I thought was the most interesting though, was when I flung the chamber on the side, and I was able to make some turbulence in it. And I guess that there were some small bits of some other junk on the silica beads, and this was able to move around in the fluid. I think that other shaking test that I did might have been a little bit weak, but this one really showed me that there was a fluid in there. After this, I decided to empty the chamber, but unfortunately for some reason, I didn't think of filming it. It actually turned out to be really cool though, so I ended up doing it again, and this is a clip from a different run. But anyway, now that it was empty, I shook it around like I did before, just as a comparison. This time, the beads were easily able to pop up and hit the top of the chamber, like you'd expect if it were totally empty. I originally chose to use these beads, just because they happened to be next to me, but they actually turned out to be really interesting. When I looked closer at them, they were all full of cracks, but they were also kind of sparkly, and some even had some color. The silica beads that I started with, definitely weren't colored in any way, and there was something weird going on here. To get a better look, I had to zoom in a lot, and I could see that some of them would reflect different colors depending on the angle. This reminded me a lot of opal, but I doubt that it's a similar mechanism going on here, and I don't really know what's happening. The beads were really cracked because the supercritical CO2 was able to get into them, 
and then I vented the pressure out really quickly. It could be that these cracks are so thin that it makes some weird thin film interference or something, but I'm kind of just making that up, and I'm not really basing it on much of anything. If any of you guys have any idea of what's going on here, I would really like to hear about it. I also think that it would be really cool if I were able to recreate this on a much larger scale, maybe using a silica bead that's closer to the size of a golf ball. I have no idea when I'll try doing this, or if it's even remotely possible, but it is something that I do want to eventually try. But anyway, that was pretty much everything that I wanted to do, but as just one last thing, I decided to replace the gauge. I bought a new one from McMaster Car, and now, I could actually see what pressure everything was at. This time, when all the dry ice was melting, the pressure on the gauge actually went up, and it got to around 500 psi. Then, as I heated it and it made it go super critical, the pressure started increasing again, and it got just above 1000 psi. It was still increasing a bit though, and after I let it sit for about 10 minutes, it ended up peaking around 1200. After this, I opened the valve, and I saw that the cloudiness only started forming the moment the pressure got below around 1000 psi. This obviously wasn't something that I could notice when the valve was broken, but it's kind of interesting. It meant that all this fogginess was probably just the two phases, liquid and gas, no longer being able to mix together. A lot of this fogginess was then able to last until it looked like it was around 50 or 70 psi, which was just around that 5 atmosphere mark. Below that, liquid CO2 isn't able to exist, so all this fogginess, which I think was liquid CO2, ended up just disappearing. Anyway, with all that being said, that was pretty much everything I wanted to try out. I think by playing around with it, I got a much better idea of how supercritical CO2 worked and what it was like, and I felt a lot more comfortable using it to make aerogels. The chamber also worked super well, and it didn't blow up and kill me, so again, a huge thanks goes out to Ben for letting me use it. When I first started this little project, I wanted to try using the chamber to make aerogel and also to extract caffeine from coffee, but I found that neither of those things would really work. Both of those things need much higher pressures and a lot longer soak times, and the O-ring that's in the chamber just wouldn't be able to handle it. To do either of these, I'd have to build a proper chamber using stainless steel and all high-pressure fittings. This video here was filmed over six months ago, and in the meantime, I actually did put together the proper chamber. I've also actually used it to make aerogel, and I'll eventually post a full video about it on my main channel Nile Red. I'm also thinking of maybe using that chamber to make decaf coffee, or to make that large-scale colored silica bead that I mentioned before. Either way though, I don't have plans to do either of those right now at the moment, but they will probably eventually get done. Also, as one last point, some of you might be wondering why this video is on Nile Blue and not the main channel Nile Red, and it's because I just didn't really feel like it fit there. I've recently decided that I want to just dedicate Nile Red to large and weird projects like making toilet paper moonshine or diamond water, and this was not something that really matched up with that. I had already filmed it all though, and it made no sense to just waste it because I had a lot of fun with this project and there's a lot of good info in it, so I decided to throw it here on Nile Blue. It's a bit weird though, because the amount of work that went into making it all happen was kind of the same as an Isle Red video, but that's just how it is. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post them to YouTube. Also, everyone on Patreon can directly message me, and if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end like you see here.